Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and it's my personal, professional, and public privilege today to welcome back Thomas Jordan, the chairman of the Swiss National Bank, to the Peterson Institute today. Jordan, Thomas Jordan and I will be having a discussion about economics and monetary policy on our stage in a moment. Uh, he is part of and one of the stars of Macro Week 2022 here at the Peterson Institute. All of the talks and conversations are available on our website, PIIE.com. And yesterday we had the privilege to host the Deputy Treasury Secretary of the United States, Wally Adeyemo, and the Finance Minister of Singapore, Lawrence Wong. Today we start with Thomas Jordan, and later this afternoon, We'll be hosting Nadia Calvino, who is the Vice President of Spain and the Chair of the IMFC. But there will be plenty of intellectual feast just now from Thomas alone. Thomas took over as Chairman of the Swiss National Bank almost precisely 10 years ago. Uh, he first joined the SNB as an economic advisor in 1997 and rose steadily through the ranks, eventually becoming Vice Chairman of the Governing Board and management of the department in Bern for financial stability, cash, finance, and risk in 2010. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Bern in 1993, and then held a three-year postdoctoral research position at the Department of Economics at Harvard University, where I was delighted to meet him at the time. Thomas is one of the many uh, noted central bankers, but still rare, who is a first-rate uh, research economist and thinker about monetary policy, as well as a practitioner. And uh, it's the Swiss government, but also the Swiss people and the international financial community are very lucky to have Thomas in the position he's in. He also serves internationally as on the board of directors of the Bank of International Settlements and on the steering committee of the Financial Stability Board and informally is a trusted member of many international groups and bodies. Uh, additionally, he somehow manages to maintain his research chops. The University of Bern appointed him an honorary professor in 2003, and he continues to occasionally lecture and study there. So it's my privilege to welcome Thomas Jordan back to the Institute. Thomas, if you would, please. Adam, nice to meet you again. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. So obviously, we live in a world right now where there's no shortage of things to talk about for a central banker, for an economic official. Uh, the war in Ukraine, which should be referred to as the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, obviously overwhelms almost everything. But at the background, uh, a Swiss central banker in particular knows that price stability is the basis for any progress. So maybe we should start there. Um, we're seeing a rise in inflation in the US, but also throughout much of the world that we haven't seen in decades. Um, Long-term government interest rates, however, have actually only moved a little. People are getting very excited, I think, today the 30-year uh, bond in the US may have breached 3% briefly, but of course these are relatively no, low numbers in the long prospect of history. So where do you see inflation expectations and how useful are market measures? How much comfort do you take about inflation from the fact that the long bonds in Switzerland, in Germany, in the US stay very stable? Well, in Switzerland, we are still quite lucky. So inflation is relatively low, interest rates are low. It seems also that inflation expectations are still well anchored. Nevertheless, I think we have to be very, very careful. When we talk to business leaders and also to households, we see that people do not really think in, in terms of inflation expectations, but they may change their behavior. And what we see at this moment is really that uh, for a very long time, for the first time, they now try to increase their prices. Firms can increase prices. Price increases are accepted. And uh, they also accept price increases from their suppliers. So we, we see really a change in behavior, um, not directly in expectations, because this is a more technical term. And that means something. So there is some change, and uh, that could be some risk to price stability also in Switzerland. So we have to be very careful and analyze the situation constantly. So when you analyze the situation, how much do you see this as spillovers from 
global factors, be it U.S. inflation or be it the energy price disruptions due to the war, how much do you see this as, as Switzerland's own, not so much fault, but caused within the Swiss economy? And does that matter for what you have to do? Well, the biggest impact is clearly from uh, energy prices. So that has the biggest impact. Then we have also to supply change um, products where we have these uh, problems where suddenly prices for, for certain goods increase quite a bit. So this is the second biggest uh, factor. And of course, also those prices that dropped during COVID are now jumping back. So these are the three main elements for having in increased uh, in inflation. So they are mainly from abroad, but nevertheless, they have a big impact uh, in, in Switzerland. And we also know that, of course, monetary policy everywhere, but also in Switzerland, uh, is and was for quite a long time expansionary. So there's a lot of liquidity. Firms are ho and households are very liquid, so they can also afford and pay these higher prices. So this is, I think, a mix that we have to analyze and follow very, very carefully. Again, not so much people are, of course, interested in what's happening in Switzerland, but they're also interested in generally mm -hmm. how a central banker in your position thinks through these things. So when it's you're seeing that people have, which is generally a good thing, liquidity, have have savings buffers, have pricing power, be it for wages or companies. Um, at what point do you decide this is an inflation trend versus just some supply shock to be ridden out? I mean, the textbook says if you see a supply shock like energy, you're just supposed to let it go, right? Well, of course, uh, we look into the future. We try to f figure out what is the best uh, inflation forecast, and then we can have a judgment whether uh, this is only temporary or whether there's more inflationary pressure into the system that then needs a, a monetary policy reaction. But again, I think we have to be careful in that respect that the models uh, may be um, also suffering from structural breaks. This time is maybe also a little bit different. So the inflationary pressure could be uh, could be bigger. So it's kind of a risk management. What kind of risk do you evaluate more? Is it the risk that you tighten too early and then having a fallback and inflation may be too low in the years to come? Or whether you fear that inflation may be too high and then you have this inflationary spiral, which again is very difficult to break. So I think at, at this moment, you have to do this kind of uh, risk management and to figure out. Personally, I believe this sh surely a substantial amount of the inflation today may be temporary, but nevertheless, there is a, it's a relatively big risk that some of this temporary inflation then feeds into a permanent inflation uh, where all goods and services are impacted, not only those like, like energy and to supply uh, chain, uh, chain um, uh, goods. And that, I think there, um, a monetary policy reaction is unavoidable and we have to make sure that uh, we do not lose credibility. Uh, central banks should not lose credibility and really maintain price stability over the medium to long term. Thank you, Thomas. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to ask you to comment on any of your peer central banks. But in the US, we've had a quite heated debate until a few months ago about the nature of inflation here, whether it was due to temporary factors or factors that monetary policy shouldn't be able to, to influence versus structural factors, COVID reopening, temporary labor market inelasticity, and so on. Um, one aspect that was here that I don't think was discussed much in Switzerland was the idea that the Fed had to catch up or at least should try to catch up for undershooting the inflation target and not running the economy hot mm -hmm. for some time. Has that been a consideration at all in Switzerland? Um, was there any sense that you were undershooting your inflation target and that was a bad thing, or was this just not an issue? Well, this is a very, I think, interesting point. And uh, of course, in, we were in the last, or have been in the last 10 years on, in an ongoing fight against deflation. So we had often inflation close to zero or even below zero. So we tried everything in order to maintain price stability and pushing up inflation back into the positive territory. And of course, that was a relatively difficult struggle. So 
interest rates, we were more or less at the lower bound, not exactly, but, but very close. We extended the balance sheet uh, 10 times over the last uh, uh, 10 years. So we did everything in order to avoid a deflationary trap. And in a way, we were successful. So every time inflation was negative, we came back into the positive territory. The Swiss economy performed also relatively well. And we had, if you look at the price level, almost for 10 years, a flat line. So the pr price stability was over, almost 100%. 100 so for our situation, and I'm not speaking about other countries, I think this idea of uh, catching up uh, uh, below average inflation from the past would not be a really good idea. So it, it would create really awkward situations where then we have to bring inflation to a very high level and then create again a recession in order to bring inflation down to something, be something below 2%. So especially for a small open economy like, like Switzerland is, I think this uh, kind of uh, averaging the inflation rate over a certain period of time is very difficult to achieve. And uh, for, for us, something that is not really, uh, really practical. That is also the reason why we have not a point target for inflation, but rather we have a definition of price stability below 2% but positive. So this is a range where we aim to be in. And if we are going out of this range, we have to take measures in order to bring inflation back into this uh, range of, uh, of price stability. Very interesting to have that perspective in the context of the discussion that you're aware has gone on here. Mm -hmm. Again, I know you don't want to speak for other countries, but I do think it's worth pointing out that a very different economy, Japan, mm -hmm. um, has had a similar ongoing battle with deflation to, to the one you faced in, in Switzerland, and similarly has done a lot of things, negative rates or effective lower bound rates, various quantitative interventions expanding the balance sheet, and similarly been able to keep deflation at bay but not been able to raise inflation up. Has this been a surprise for you? Is there rethinking of how we think about inflation as a result of, say, your experience and the Japanese experience that we should be doing? I mean, or is it just the, the, the is it secular stagnation that the negative, that the, uh, excuse me, R star effectively has gone negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the other hand, both Switzerland and Japan have had quite good per capita growth. Mm -hmm. Could you expand a bit more on what meaning we should take from you and Japan and no. others having this struggle? Well, it, it's a very complex um, uh, question. And the, of course, with R star relatively low, close to zero or in negative in the case of Switzerland, uh, having ha ha higher inflation would be positive so that we had a little bit uh, bigger room of maneuver, march of maneuver to, to, uh, to use monetary policy in case of a recession or a negative shock. On the other hand, I think the, uh, the goal of price stability is very well defined and the Swiss people really wants to have price stability. They even ask all the times 2% is not, uh, not price stability. So we have a system that um, I think can live with this complex situation relatively well. So the, the range of price stability helps us. So sometimes even in, in this kind of a little bit international deflation environment, you are rather clo closer to zero. And maybe in the future when this environment changes again, we might be rather closer to 2% again. But all in all, with the combination of negative interest rates, but also using the balance sheet, I think we could manage this situation quite well. What we also figured out is that the economy becomes relatively flexible. So negative inflation doesn't mean that this is a disaster at all. It depends really on if it's no secular trend, if it's just an episode and you have this appreciation of the Swiss franc, you have a negative interest, uh, a negative inflation for some time, that becomes part of the adjustment process. And we had a few episodes where negative inflation at the end was helpful but of course only for one uh, to, to 18, one year to 18 months, and then it had to be back again into positive territories. Uh, so on, on the, that perspective, I do not really see a necessity to fundamentally change uh, this, uh, this approach. Um, otherwise, we would then really deviate from the concept of price stability, which may be politically uh, not feasible, and it's really against the mandate and against that uh, what uh, I think uh, citizens in Switzerland expect from the Swiss uh, National Bank. 
if you'll indulge me, I remember when I joined the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee in 2009, I had to give testimony to the Treasury Select Committee in the UK, and one of the things I mentioned was I at least had been surprised that Japan actually adapted relatively well to zero or mildly negative inflation. It wasn't as harmful. And Switzerland's another example where a country adapted. Um, that said, there are people who go back to a point you made earlier, which is there are advantages to having more room for maneuver, I think is how you put it, if, if, you're, if you're away from the zero lower bound. Is, if, if monetary policy in Switzerland or other places for the reasons you said may not be getting away from the zero lower bound, should we have a different view of fiscal policy? I mean, does the results of us managing the COVID crisis, for example, indicate we should be more aggressive with discretionary fiscal policy? Is that a way out of the zero lower bound problem? Well, I think fiscal policy surely plays an important role but let me just come back, Adam, to one second to the, the previous point. Please. I think if you go back the last 10 years, so even with an inflation target or a different uh, definition of price stability, a little bit higher than the one we had, we could use it only once. That would have probably in 2009 when we lowered rates. And from then on, as, everybody, uh, as any other central bank as well, we were at this uh, zero lower bound, or then we lowered rates even into the negative territory. So it was not something that we could use constantly. It was only once. And I think it will change again when we are in a different environment. When we go back into uh, the first decade of uh, this century, there we had uh, nominal rates that were quite um, similar to the ones uh, a little bit below to the European Central Bank. And we could go up and down and use, again, this... Uh, um, room of maneuver several times. So there we are in a different environment, and in the last 10 to 12 years, we were in, a, in another uh, environment, which then created the difficulties where we had to use quantitative easing or interventions, as in the case of, uh, um, uh, of the Swiss National Bank. Now, coming back to your point regarding f fiscal policy, uh, it surely fiscal policy can help, and on the other hand, we have also uh, from a central banker's perspective, to be very careful to what extent we do not go into the trap of fiscal dominance. And then suddenly it will have a negative impact again on the way monetary policy can be conducted and pursued. So I think that the, uh, having a fiscal policy that is helpful during crisis, but nevertheless sufficiently sound in the medium to long term is very, very important. Well, again, I know you're familiar with this, but if we could spell it out a bit more for our audience. On, on this very stage, some years ago, uh, former Federal Reserve Chair Ben Bernanke offered a proposal about a very explicit coordination mm. with fiscal policy that was contingent on certain conditions vis-a-vis -vis the effective lower bound. Your predecessor as chair of the SNB um, Philip Hildebrand, along with Stanley Fisher and some colleagues from BlackRock a few years ago, wrote uh, a piece arguing for, a, I think it was even central bankers sort of taking over fiscal policy in, in times of extremists. Mm. Do, should we be considering some kind of formal arrangement about when fiscal policy is dealing with a crisis versus normal, or is ad hoc the best we can do? What role should fiscal rules play here? Well, I'm, I'm careful in, in, in that yeah. respect. Uh, I would rather go for the ad hoc solutions. And I can give you a very good example in Switzerland. During COVID crisis, for the first time, we really had a common instrument where we provided loans to Swiss SMEs at the extremely high speed. So it was a combination of using the private sector, the Minister of Finance, and the Swiss National Bank. But everybody uh, kept its own responsibility. So the private sector provided the loans. Um, they had the speed, they had the, the, the link to all their, their clients. We provided the entire liquidity and negative interest rates so that the loans then were provided at zero to the, uh, uh, to the firms. And the government gave a guarantee in case there would be some uh, losses. So that was an extremely um, successful, efficient, and speedy tool that was ad hoc, 
got exactly what Switzerland needed at that time. And I, I would be very careful in doing too much in advance with cer certain rules because every situation will be different. And as a central bank, I think we should be really um, careful not then to be in a position where we suddenly have to finance a fiscal expenditure that in a way is not uh, foreseen in the entire concept of the division of labor between uh, the Minister of Finance and, uh, and the Central Bank. Thank you, that's very clear. Um, and of course, it's always interesting and appreciated when a Central European economic policymaker speaks about discretion as opposed to rules. So uh, I, 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 just, I, I, I enjoy that. Um, Without being too cute. So this is discretion on the certain principles. I understand. So this is it's what I used important. to call discipline discretion. Yeah. Once upon a time. Exactly. Um, without overdoing the dad joke banter of central bankers. Um, of course, one of the things that's distinctive about Switzerland, which we haven't, or the Swiss economic regime, I should say, which we haven't touched upon yet, is uh, the SMB's need to take into account the exchange rate. Um, you've spoken about this issue before on this stage as well as other mm -hmm. places. And just again, I had a conversation here with Lawrence Wong uh, from Singapore yesterday, and they of course are another small open free market economy mm -hmm. that ends up feeling they have to very carefully manage their exchange rate. So um, can I just go back to that a bit and just say, ask you to expand a little bit on how that's worked out for you and not you personally, for the Swiss economy. Um, and what, whether there are other economies that should be following your example. Uh, is it just a question of size? If you're small and open, you have to think very much harder about the exchange rate or are there other circumstances under which you think it's good for economies to have an intermediate target that involves the exchange rate? Well, we do not have really an uh, intermediate target for the exchange rate, but we take, of course, the exchange rate into account and we are using interventions when we believe that the exchange rate is too strong uh, and then having a negative impact on, on inflation and bringing inflation into a negative territories. But uh, in a way, it's not our first preference to use interventions or, or being extremely explicit about the exchange rate. So if I go back to at the beginning uh, of this century when we started with our monetary policy concept. We always stressed the importance of the exchange rate, but we always used the interest rate in order to uh, have a monetary reaction. That was mainly sufficient. So lower rates uh, then uh, um, weakened the Swiss franc, increasing the rate, uh, the, the interest rate then uh, strengthened the Swiss franc. But then of course, after 2008, nine. The situation completely changed. Everybody was a zero. The, the, the traditional interest rate differential vanished. And there we had to use uh, interventions and extending the balance sheet only in order to maintain halfway acceptable monetary, uh, monetary conditions. And uh, that was um, given by the situation. It was, as I said before, not our first choice. We had to do that in order to avoid really a negative inflationary trend. And of course, as soon as the situation changes, we are more than happy to go back to a more traditional implementation of monetary policy where interventions are not anymore uh, having the same importance as they have uh, today. So it depends really what is going on on the international financial market uh, markets, whether uh, interest rates everywhere will go up so that this interest, interest rate differential will increase again. And then we could go back to this uh, um, let's say more traditional, more normal uh, kind of uh, monetary implementation. Well, I mean, but the exchange rate, Adam, is, yeah. I think for a small open economy, monetary conditions are influenced by the exchange rate and by in interest rates. And if the exchange rate becomes uh, too extreme, then obviously we, we have a very difficult situation for the economy itself, and then we may go into a deflationary situation. And that, that is true whether we are above zero with, with interest rates or whether we are really at the effective, uh, effective lower bond. Right. So the exchange rate plays a much bigger role for a small open economy as Switzerland as compared to 
to the Eurozone or to the US. Well, and, and as you say, so the, the choice of instrument depends on circumstances, but the importance of the exchange rate channel remains either way. Um, but so I'll, I'll just following up a bit on that, obviously it was not your desired goal, but the Swiss National Bank has accumulated quite a lot of different a external assets over the last, since 2008. Um, we're now shifting to a world where, as you hinted, interest rate differentials, at least with the US and some other places, are likely to widen. Um, there's quantitative tightening for those who believe in it um, from, from the Fed in the offing and maybe from the ECB. Uh, do you have to, I'm obviously not asking for you to reveal anything, but just sort of strategically, do you have to think about how you manage these assets on the bank's balance sheet in a proactive way, or can you just let them roll off? I mean, does this, over, I don't wanna say overhang, but accumulation of external assets change once you see the other central banks going into a tightening cycle? That, that will be a key question for us. So once we come to a point where monetary policy has to be tightened in the future, if the inflationary pressure goes up, doesn't uh, remain at the level where we are today, then of course you have to think what is uh, the best uh, instrument or the combination of instruments. So of course, increasing interest rates is a possibility. Selling asset is also a possibility, selling for an exchange or a combination of the two. And then we have to figure out what is the best combination in order to steer monetary uh, conditions such that uh, the uh, inflation rate remains most of the time within the range of, of price stability. In our case, the situation is a little bit more complex because assets do not run out. Right. So uh, we, if, uh, if a dollar bond is uh, uh, paid back, uh, we still have the liquidity in dollars. We have to reinvest that or we have to do a, uh, a negative intervention or counter in intervention in order to sell the dollars and buy the Swiss franc. So this is a little bit more complex. So the balance sheet doesn't come down by itself over time. We have to figure out exactly what is the best combination of selling assets and uh, adjusting interest rates. Well, well just intellectually, uh, I and others will be looking forward to the decisions you and the committee make because, uh, or the council make, because that is going to be uh, a bit of a tricky thing and not all central banks, some do, but not all central banks have your mix of assets. Um, obviously, as I mentioned in my insufficient introduction of you, you play, just as Switzerland does, but you individually play a, a larger role in global discussions of financial stability and monetary policy. Mm -hmm. So if I could ask you about some of the broader issues facing the international financial system now, um, let's start with the fact just picking up on the idea of we're suddenly going to have, or maybe not so suddenly, going to have interest rate differentials probably between the US, the Euro area, and then China, Japan, possibly Switzerland, that we haven't seen in some time. How much would say your BIS or FSB hat on, are you worried about the Fed's tightening cycle having spillovers? Obviously emerging markets, developing countries as much as any. and what, if anything, should the international financial community be doing about it? Well, I am not that worried about it uh, because uh, you always have to think what would be the alternative. So if the, uh, the Fed does not tighten monetary policy, given the inflationary situation, maybe in a couple of years, the, the consequences for everybody else would be much bigger. So for us, the normalization of monetary policy elsewhere, especially in the US, but also in Europe, in fact, is a very positive sign. So it means that uh, the economic situation is robust enough, and uh, that uh, also means that uh, uh, the uh, room of maneuver for our monetary policy will rather increase than de decrease. So, so in a way, uh, the, this is a relatively positive, uh, uh, these are positive news. So I know also for some of the emerging markets that could be uh, a more tricky uh, situation, but uh, I think given the, the situation just to postpone uh, a necessary monetary policy normalization in, in order to limit uh, the, uh, the increase in interest rate differential with other countries, uh, 
It's probably also something that is not a good advice because if it's necessary, it's necessary. And if you postpone it, the necessity will become even, even bigger. I think if the countries focus on their need in order to maintain price stability over the medium to long term, this is uh, the, the best uh, policy they can do. And of course, countries that are, that, that are affected by these uh, interest changes, they have to see what is their best reaction to that. But uh, the, the problem doesn't go away if the Fed uh, waited even longer, although it's a necessity to, to normalize monetary policy. I, I, I feel I have to push back on your use of the term normalize. Um, they're raising rates because we're in, I hope, an abnormal situation of the highest inflation, highest inflation rate in 40 years. Um, so they're behaving normally, but I'm not sure this is normalized, right? We're expecting, at least financial markets are expecting that interest rates are gonna come back down after the inflation beast is slain this time. Uh, what am I missing when you use the term normalize? No, well, uh, I cannot really comment on the US uh, no, 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 policy, but, the but term you, you are pointing to a, a really a, a little bit of puzzle. You, usually, as we all learned, that you have to move real rates in order to have a, an impact on inflation over the medium to long term. And if inflation is increasing faster than uh, the increase in interest rate, then of course monetary policy does not is not really tighter than before. So I think we, we have all to figure out uh, from Switzerland to all other countries exactly to what extent really this um, inflation at the moment is purely temporary, which comes uh, goes away by itself, and which one has to be really combated by an increase in the real in, in interest rate. And say so this will be one of the key questions and. Uh, have it to, or giving the, the wrong conclusions from, from this analysis will either bring much more inflation or then really an unnecessary tightening of, of monetary policy. The, um, thank you very much. The, our colleague here at Peterson, Olivia Blanchard, and our board vice chair, Larry Summers, um, were out ahead over a year ago forecasting uh, that inflation would be too high in the U.S. Um, again, not asking you to comment on the U.S. policy. But um, interestingly, both of them have increasingly clearly in recent months said that they don't see how the Fed can have a soft landing, or at least it's very unlikely. Um, were the U.S., to sustain a soft landing, I mean, sustain a hard landing, basically have a recession in order to bring down inflation. Um, does that have any lasting implications? I mean, does that change, do you think, the path of real interest rates going forward? Or is this just, that's what you got to do, this is the cycle? I mean, I, I'm asking a sort of strange question. I can see you're, you're sort of thinking, what is he talking about? I guess, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that there's a whole generation of bond traders and investors who have never seen this cycle or anything like it. Um, and there's also this sort of tension that the 10-year bond, the 30-year bond seem to indicate we're gonna be back to status quo ante in a few years. So. If we go through this kind of recession, do we just go back to secular stagnation or do we, are we normalized in your term? I mean, what's the long-term impact, if any? Well, I believe that does not really depend on monetary policy decisions. So it's mainly structural. Mm -hmm. And if you have to fight a, an inflation and that ends up in a recession uh, for a couple of months, that doesn't mean that you change the structure of the economy. I think these are really two separate issues. Of course, monetary policy can have a certain influence, uh, maybe even um, on, on long-term rates, especially with QE programs, uh, that, uh, that is possible. But nevertheless, I think the, the main elements of uh, long-term growth are given through the structure of the economy and are not uh, really related to, uh, to, to monetary po policy. And again, here it's really the, what is the alternative? So if the hard landing is unavoidable, and if you fear the hard landing and you wait, 
the hard landing will be even harder. So I, I think it's it, it's really w what is the alternative given the situation that you are in, and uh, uh, you, you can complain about uh, uh, spillovers, negative side effects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if this is true, they will not go away. So you can postpone your decisions forever, but probably you make it even worse. So I think uh, it's very reasonable to to think what, what is necessary now, given uh, the, the current situation, and then not to hesitate to take the right decision, even if there will be a little bit uh, a bumpy road. Uh, and just to be clear, not that they can't speak for themselves, but that's where Blanchard and Summers are as well, of course. Mm -hmm. um, let me switch gears. And as we said at the start, all of the spring meetings of the IMF, the G20, the G7, BIS, everybody, FSB, take place under the shadow of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the effects on the Ukrainian people, first and foremost, but then on the world. Um, one aspect of this has been the unprecedented financial sanctions, including essentially tying up the Central Bank of Russia's reserves. Um, as a central banker, how should we think about that? Is, is sanctions on central banks something that we should expect going forward in foreign policy? What role should central banks have? Obviously not in making foreign policy national security decisions, mm -hmm. but in designing or implementing financial sanctions in the future. I mean, again, I'm not asking you to comment on the current sanctions in the sense that I know you and the Swiss National Bank are implementing them, but how should central banks be thinking about this? Well, I think all sanctions are really a political decision. So uh, central banks should uh, shy away from being involved too much and say, well, we favor or disfavor certain sanctions. So it's really the government and the parliament deciding on those sanctions. They are for political reasons, but of course they have an economic impact. And uh, in those areas where uh, countries have to figure out what is the most effective sanction and what could be the negative consequences of certain sanctions uh, on uh, their own economies, it's probably some advice could, could be helpful, but nevertheless, I think uh, central banks should be careful not uh, really uh, then to make decisions that should be taken by governments or, or by parliaments. So giving advice as uh, we do all the time, I think, the, I think that, that makes a lot of sense so that uh, uh, politicians, uh, the government and parliaments can figure out what, what makes sense or what doesn't make sense. I think this is, uh, is fine, it's okay. On the other hand, uh, w when uh, we become too political and uh, uh, I think that could also be negative for central banks into the future. I think so we should make this clear distinction. Politics, uh, foreign policy, sanctions are implemented and uh, decided by governments yeah. and central banks are in charge of monetary policy. Obviously, the current set of sanctions um, were put together very quickly with mm -hmm. all credit to the leaders of the democratic governments that pursued them. But if, if you at the Swiss National Bank or other central banks could prepare in advance for the next round of sanctions, you know, not that you know who they'll be against, but mm -hmm. what would be necessary? I mean, is there any form of international coordination in advance or knowledge sharing or preparation among supervisory authorities of banks that you would like to see in place I mean, God forbid that somebody else invades a, a, a hmm. peaceful country, but hmm. if it should happen, is there stuff you would like to see in advance of next time? Well, I didn't really think through all the details there. Maybe in a couple of months, uh, central banks could have a review on that, to what extent uh, uh, it, it makes sense to analyze that. Um, w what we know is that the implementation of, of sanctions often is difficult because... Uh, the devil lies in the details and you have to then implement that on the ground. So a certain preparation also for governments then to make every ordinance in, in a clear way such that the uh, those who have or, or affected by the sanctions know exactly what to do. I think this is something that uh, I think would, would be helpful. To what extent this is then 
sh should be done by the government or by central banks, I don't know. So this has to be figured out a little bit uh, later. Of course, uh, it, it will be interesting in analyzing for central banks uh, to what extent the sanctions will have an impact on international financial markets, uh, not only regarding the uh, blockage of the reserves by uh, of the Russian central bank, but everything else, uh, to what extent that had a, a certain impact on, on financial stability. In the case of Switzerland, we were altogether impacted relatively uh, little. So uh, we had almost no Russian assets at, at the Swiss National Bank. And uh, for, for, from that perspective, there was almost no impact. And the financial sector had very limited uh, exposure towards Russia. So, but that is not the case for all countries. Right. And we do not yet know exactly what are the, uh, uh, are the consequences. And often in the medium to long term, uh, then people f figure out that the sanctions had unintended consequences as well. They are not immediately, uh, uh, cannot be immediately identified, but they will show up la later. And of course, I think uh, an analysis in order to be prepared for, hopefully not a next time, is always, I, I think, uh, uh, makes sense. You, you started down exactly where I was hoping to ask you next, Thomas, which is for countries like Switzerland, like Singapore, again, not speaking for anybody but yourself, but where you have a financial sector that is very large and very internationally connected, uh, does the exercise of these kinds of sanctions uh, raise difficulties or opportunities for, for Switzerland as a banking sector going forward? I mean, is it do people want to be outside the U.S. system and therefore would be more eager to be in Switzerland, or is it Switzerland's voluntary decision to join in the sanctions and including the ones on private banking of Russian oligarchs? Does that decrease Switzerland as an offshore, I don't want to say offshore, as an as a independent financial sector. I mean, do you have to think through the implications of this for Zurich and the banks in Switzerland? It's very difficult to give you here a precise answer, so we will see in the future. Well, sanctions in general are never good for a financial sector, so it's not good for the Swiss financial sector nor for Singapore nor for the US, I think that makes life of the financial industry more, more difficult. And of course, without sanction, it would be better. We'll see to what extent the fragmentation of the world will have some impact. Uh, that could also be positive or negative, exactly as, as you uh, mentioned before, that uh, say people will go out of uh, the US or other financial sector more into Switzerland, or whether people are disappointed that Switzerland uh, followed European Union sanctions or and say, well, we have to f f find a, a new financial center. I think the, the, uh, the reality is such that for Switzerland, um, the financial sector already followed often the US and European sanctions independent of the decision of the Swiss uh, government because uh, they wanted to remain very active in those those areas. So they did that on a voluntary basis that was not enforced by the Swiss government. But at the end, the impact was uh, uh, in reality more or, less, more or less the same. So we'll see to what extent this time there is actually a difference. It's probably uh, more symbolic than, uh, than effective because uh, independent of the decision of Switzerland, banks would probably follow very similar rules uh, regarding business with Russia. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the fragmentation of the world, and of course, these kind of rules probably are um, not ideal for any financial activity that is cross-border and, and globally oriented. Yeah. Relatedly is the issue of central bank reserves and reserve currencies. Yeah. And um, again, this may not be something you can directly comment on, but you know, there's a lot of chatter about whether the recent events reestablish or clear away any doubts about the role of the dollar because mm. not just Swiss banks, but Chinese banks, for example, seem to be complying because they don't want to be out of the dollar system. 
But then, of course, there's also people out there saying this is the moment at which lots of countries around the world, lots of central banks around the world decide, oh, my God, I might agree with them sanctioning Russia, but what happens when they sanction me or my buddies? So sort of with your FSB hat on, do we need to worry about shifts in international reserves? Do we need to think about different hmm. roles for reserve currencies where Switzerland's hmm. currency get under further appreciation pressure because people are going to try to swap dollars into hmm. Swiss franc reserves? All in all, I believe this risk is relatively limited, at least uh, for the time being. Um, there's a certain risk that some countries might decide that they will shift some of the reserves uh, elsewhere. They could even go into gold rather than into a fiat uh, currency. That that could happen. But I think for I think the, 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 the large group of of relevant countries, I cannot really imagine that they really switch into another uh, reserve currency at this moment because I think. All other currencies next to the dollar have not only advantages but also many disadvantages. So the world has to change a lot, I think, before that actually happens. So I'm, I'm not pessimistic with uh, uh, the status of the dollar as uh, the world's uh, reserve currency. Thank you. Um, you've been very generous about answering whatever weird questions I throw your way and showing off your combination of analytical intelligence and political care, and I'm grateful, Thomas. Um, I, I am going to push you a little bit further. Um, you are here, and you have come he here to Washington twice a year, every year for a long time, except, of course, during COVID, um, to participate in the major meetings of the international financial institutions. Um, you meet with the BIS, you meet with all. The, looking back at sort of the international financial architecture. There was a lot of talk after 1998 about reform. There was a lot of talk after 2008 about reform. Um, we now come through COVID in which the G7 and the G20, at least in my and many people's opinion, failed spectacularly to deliver for the developing world in the face of COVID. Um, and we have a situation um, where at least potentially China and the US are going to be further politicizing the use, I'm saying this, I'm not putting words in your mouth, politicizing the exercise of international lending and the IMF and the World Bank. What would be your agenda for reform of the international financial architecture from here? Is it just, it doesn't matter, we have to firefight Ukraine just as we firefight COVID, just as we firefight crises as they mm. come along? Or is there a, a better system for in doing better by the developing world and mm. insulating us from China, US politics and the international financial system? And what, what should the vision be for the international financial architecture? Very difficult question, Adam, and uh, I hesitate to give you here a precise answer, but it's, it's, pro it's probably wrong. But nevertheless, I, I believe what we ignore too much is really structural policies. So we, we know that many of these countries have difficulties receiving funds at the international uh, financial markets in order to finance investments. But we also know that often these investments uh, then are not uh, profitable enough and uh, uh, they are... Uh, then uh, money spent without the, the revenue necessary or, or to have the growth potential for that country. So I think the, the, the really a point that is the most difficult one, not only for the, the developing world, even for, I think, in many countries in the advanced economies as well, um, structural reforms that make these countries more robust so that the growth potential becomes bigger is at really is the basis for everything else. So if you only uh, in, in every crisis provide uh, the necessary liquidity and we land here and there, etc., that may be necessary, that may be helpful for the moment, but we cannot really solve those, those issues. So we, um, in most of, of our the meetings, uh, not only Swiss National Bank, also the uh, 
the Swiss Ministry of Finance always is, uh, we are stressing the point that we need the necessary structural reforms to make those countries, these countries stronger so that they can help over time themselves better than they do at, at the moment. And I think this is something that is, is absolutely necessary. And of course, when you have a crisis, uh, we, we have uh, to help those countries. You were very negative. On the other hand, the, the IMF had law, uh, during COVID, I think 70 countries yep. got emergency uh, yep. li liquidity extremely fast, faster than any time uh, before. Uh, the IMF is now uh, also installing a new facility uh, that should help those countries in, in the short, but also in the medium term. We had this increase in SDRs, yeah. probably also usable for these kind of funds. So I think that there are many initiatives, many uh, also uh, financial means that are um, usable for, for, for this, uh, for this uh, support. And on the other hand, I think the, the, the a little bit the traditional advice of the IMF, how you structure a country, how you organize a country, how the structural reform should be done, should not be forgotten. I think this is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, we will not see the, necessary, the, uh, the growth and uh, the, the, the robustness of those countries. Well, and you are quite justified, Thomas, to list those things that the IMF did in fact do. Mm -hmm. um, and I do praise our colleagues there for the amount of emergency aid and processing of that in a very short time. And of course, our colleagues here, including Maury Obsveld, Ted Truman, and others, mm -hmm pushed very hard for the uh, SDR allocation that we got. Um, going on the structural reforms point, and I realize we're getting close to the end, so you, you, you have two more questions. Um, on the structural reforms point, the, the biggest structural reform or transition I think, at least I hope we're all facing, is decarbonization and the transition to new energy sources. Mm. Again, thinking as a central bank or as a monetary policymaker in general, if we're going to be in a world where that likely involves a succession of price increases on carbon and particular supplies, not just one all one time supply shock, and probably accompanied by a succession of public investments in this transition, how should monetary policy react? I mean, is it is, is is there any adaptations you think monetary policy needs to make in terms of defining the inflation target or what to monitor or the time frames you look at things when we're where we hope we're going to see this ongoing transition well it's a very i think very important uh, uh, question and uh, well in 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 Siri and I hope that uh, the mandates really are strong enough we should maintain price stability because this is, is uh, something that uh, uh, people expect from us and, and it, that will not be the first structural change and not the first one that has a series of steps. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is uh, something that we should uh, definitely go for, for maintaining uh, price stability. Th the point you raised before is a really important one. So if we expect really energy becomes more expensive uh, over time when we are having this transition, that also means that we have a, a real income loss that at the end is probably um, um, reducing incomes by ordinary households. Yeah. And this is also, I think, something that we should not forget. It's absolutely crucial that we manage this transition in an intelligent way and that it is possible worldwide, but also in most countries, including Switzerland, to provide sufficient clean energy at reasonable prices so that this transition can be managed also from a perspective of price stability, but also from a perspective of minimizing income losses. And this, I think, the support of uh, the population with respect to the transition really depends. We saw that now at many places, whether this is something where they suffer from income losses or whether this is something that uh, is, can be managed in a reasonable way. I think this is one of the key, I think, uh, duties of governments now to figure out how to manage this uh, transition as clever as possible. And we saw already now with uh, uh, last year and this year what the negative impact of high energy prices right. can be, especially on low income households. Uh, 
and uh, I think we should not really ignore that. Our colleague, you know well, uh, at Peterson Jump, Sonny Ferry, did a piece for us last fall um, talking about these realities of real income shifts in the transitions. I know you're aware of them and many of your colleagues, but the public discussion sometimes gets a little fantastic that we're gonna have public investment and we're gonna have financial reallocation and it's all gonna be pro-growth and it may be necessary, but that doesn't mean it's pleasant. And I appreciate your, your including that concept in your discussion. Um, finally, for today, um, I'd like to ask you about the related but separate issues of central bank digital currencies and private crypto or cyber currencies. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that the Swiss National Bank and the IMF are having an important conference of central bankers next month to talk about some of these themes. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with the FSB and the BIS, you've been thinking about these issues. What is the use case, in a sense, for central bank digital currencies for a country like Switzerland? Not that necessarily you should adopt your own, or maybe you should, mm -hmm. but you know, if the European, if the European Central Bank has a CBDC, um, does it help you? Does it help the world or does it not really matter? But also the private crypto. Um, at this moment, and I raised this with Deputy Secretary Adeyemo yesterday, you know, a lot of the sales pitches for private cyber currencies are, we're libertarians, we don't want to be expropriated by government. Look, this is exactly the kind of situation with the Ukraine sanctions. And I would think, and Sec Deputy Secretary Adeyemo didn't go this far, but you know, the idea that this is a moment where you can sort of force some of these cryptocurrencies to say either you're subject to the same sanctions requirements as bank, traditional banks and traditional financial institutions, or you're on the wrong side of the law. Mm. So just we seem to be at a transition point potentially on both CBDC and private currencies. How are you viewing this? Well, interesting point, and we are discussing that at the Swiss National Bank intensively, also with our colleagues at, at all the central banks. Now, you, you raised exactly the right question. What is the use case for a retail CBDC, for example? And um, so far, uh, for a country like Switzerland, where we have a really developed payment system, a uh, very efficient one, uh, one that is uh, even developed further, making more speed, uh, lower cost, etc. The use case is not really here. So, if, but there is a certain risk that when the Swiss National Bank issued a CBDC, that of course we will shift uh, uh, or having a certain shift in the allocation of deposits away from the private sector to, to the central bank, and we have a very big impact on the financial sector. So we have to be very careful if there is no use case, and then we come with a CBDC, and the interest in the CB, CBDC is rather having a safe, uh, a safe asset than a, me, a medium of exchange. It will have a very big impact on, on the financial sector. So we have to be very, very careful. But uh, may maybe uh, in five, 10 years, the situation may be completely different and the view views can evolve. Regarding the private uh, 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 cryptocurrencies, what in my view is absolutely key is the unit of account. So a dollar or a Swiss franc. This is the, the currency, the unit of account for a country. And we should enforce that this unit of account is used for uh, the main uh, tra transaction. Whether then the actual money is provided by the central bank or by anybody else, this is a second, uh, secondary question. If you issue a, a stable coin where the unit is a Swiss franc, uh, I assume that you should follow very closely the same rules as a bank because you issue money. And if you, you, you have the same uh, promise that you transfer this money back into a Swiss national bank uh, uh, money, and of course, then you should uh, you have the same activity, the same risks, so and the same rules, uh, principle that should should apply. All the other cryptocurrencies where the unit of account is a completely different one. This is, in my view, more an asset, a speculative asset, and not really uh, a money. And we will see what uh, what the, whether the demand is going up or down. Uh, 
But I think what is really crucial is the unit of account. And then when a private a bank or somebody else is issuing money in that unit of account, it should follow really the same rules as a commercial bank is following today. Very clear. Thank you very much, Tomas. You've given us a great deal of insight and you've been very patient and generous in answering my questions. Um, and I'm sure our audience will have more questions and we'll be looking forward to your next speeches and comments for more elucidation. And just to close, May I say, Herzlichen Glückwunsch on the 10th anniversary of your appointment as chair of the Swiss National Bank. Thank you very much, Adam. It was really a pleasure Thank being you with you today. And just to remind everyone once again, we were delighted to feature Thomas Jordan, chair of the Swiss National Bank, as part of Macro Week 2022 at the Peterson Institute. We'll reconvene at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time today for a presentation and discussion by Nadia Calvino, the chair of the IMFC and the vice president of Spain. Hope to see you then. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank